is a female. I'm the only female here. <laughs> I'm hoping that um, that improves. That's always a challenge to um, get um, people uh, female in STEM. But well, thank you for having me. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, how to build a production big data pipeline. So before I start, I just want to get a raise of hands so I can adjust my speed at which I'm going. Is everyone here familiar or have dabbled with big data? Um, can I get a show of hands of who is familiar and who have dabbled with big data? OK, perfect. Then my talk is, there's like three people in the room, so my talk is apt because I lay out the context of what is big data. So if you know all of you are familiar, I'm going to skip, but it's good. So before anything else, a little bit about myself first to introduce myself to you guys to break the ice. First things first, I love data, <laughs> of course. So I'm in the right field and I'm in the right uh, team. Um, I have 15 plus years of software development uh, experience, mostly focused on data. Uh, with the past five years, focus on big data. So for the past five years, I've been the engineering manager for what we call the Autodesk Data Platform, or ADP for short. That is the de facto data platform used by the entire company, the uh, entire Autodesk. It's built um, right here in Singapore. Now it's being maintained globally, but we started building the infrastructure and the whole idea concept here in Singapore. Um, so also last 2017 and 2018, I led a team of um, UC Davis Masters of Business Analytics students uh, into a project of what we called system <coughs> incident prediction. During that time, there was no term for it yet, but. 2018 is the, is the period where everyone started, you know, they want to be able to predict uh, system incidents and that, now we have a term for it, which is what we call AI ops or AI operations. Um, what I'm passionate about, uh, except uh, apart from data, is strategy, technology and innovation, also teamwork and team culture. Me being an engineering manager, I want there to be a good uh, culture within the team. and. I love sports. I love tennis primarily and skateboarding, both of which are on hold because I just busted my knee. But there you go, a little bit about myself, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna be talking about today, I wanna introduce, you know, what is big data? What's the big deal about it, right? Um, and also a little bit, I will talk about the architecture of what we have uh, for the Autodesk data platform. Granted, it's a bit high level, but I think it's just appropriate for what we have here. And I'm gonna walk through how do we build um, a big data pipeline. What is a big data pipeline to begin with, right? Why do we wanna build it? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, okay? Um, so I have reserved some time for Q&A um, towards the end. So if you have, if you do have questions, I would just kindly ask you to, I, I'm welcome questions, please do ask them. Um, I would just ha ask you to hold it till the end so that we have enough time to go through the entire um, presentation. Is that okay for everyone? Cool. All right, first and foremost, big data. What is so special about it, right? So if we think about data, can someone, uh, especially for those people who haven't touched big data, which is most of the room, when I say the word data, what do you normally think about? How do we, you know, what is the technology that we use for data when I say data? Databases, great. That's right. A lot of numbers. A lot of numbers. Okay, that's great. Which is great because those are the two things, actually, <laughs> two um, illustrations that they have. People usually think about numbers. I kid you not. In this day and age, people do still use Excel sheets as their database. Honestly, I don't. I don't know. But yes, the Excel sheets and databases. Right. So. When we talk about big data, what is the difference then between big data and data? What makes it so big, right? So let's think about this for a while. In 2019, this is what happens in an internet minute in 60 seconds. 18 point, uh, my eyesight is not so good and I don't want to block the camera. 18.1 million texts sent, 4.5 million views, I don't know, 87,500 tweets, 347,000 Instagram. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but you can see in, in one minute, a lot of things are happening right now. And this is largely due to the advent of the internet, right? So can we all agree then that if I look at the numbers here that this 
this data is not small, right? This is this data is big actually. This data is is massive. So um, it is actually it is um sorry, why I had that. So let me share some facts about data with you, right? Actually, 90% of all the data that we have in the world right now were collected over the past two years. So it boggles the mind that there's been like, we've, we've had like what, more than 5,000 years of history, but the amount of data that we have has been collected in the last two years. That's just how it blew up, right? And by 2025, it is estimated that we would have around 463 exabytes of data. That is why I put this, just to give context. What is an exabyte of data? Exabyte is here. It is 1,000 to the power of six, and there's a lot of zeros over there. Suffice to say, it's huge, it's massive, right? So if we look at that, and we agree that this is big, right? What are the aspects, or what are the different um, areas of this that makes it big data? First and foremost, it's the volume. We can see 1 million, 1 million, 2.1 million. It's big, it happens in 60 seconds, just to say. So volume is quite huge. The velocity at which this data is coming through also is quite fast, right? In order for us to get 2.1 million snaps in 60 seconds, it has to go through at a very fast rate. And it's not a rate that is easily handled, certainly by an Excel sheet, right? And then also, if you look at the, th the third uh, aspect of it is, is a, it's a lot of different variations of data. It's not just texts. There are videos, there are music, there are pictures. It's a lot of different, different kinds of um, data. So going back to traditional thinking, right? Do you think that these are gonna be easily handled by a database? Honestly, I think not, right? And not only, so basically when we talk about big data, Usually big data comes with three Vs, and these are the three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. But as more and more data are collected, and as more and more people and companies are processing data, we come up with new Vs every day. So I'm not gonna talk about all the Vs, but for big data, this is the three primary Vs that you have to be aware of, right? And so if we're gonna talk about that, if we think about it, how do we collect and store these kind of data? Again, database, yes, maybe you can store it in a database, but it's not gonna be usable. <laughs> um, and then how do we process these data to find two more Vs? Veracity, how do we know how true the data is with all the fake news and fake information out there? How do we know if your data has high integrity and has high accuracy? And the next one is how do we unlock the value of this data? In order for us to unlock the value, we need to be able to do to process the data, to do some analytics on it, right? To slice and dice, and, and finally do predictive analytics on it, right? Um, in order to do that, we need uh, the traditional technology that we have <coughs> used in the past is not sufficient. It may be able to store the data. You can store it uh, in a database and a blob. When I'm talking about database, I'm talking about relational databases. Relational databases are not really good for these kinds of things because if you think about it, how do you store music? How do you store pictures? And storing is one thing. How do you enable processing on videos? How do you enable processing on pictures? Databases, traditional relational databases are not good enough. So let me share a little bit on how we are handling this kinds of big data in Autodesk. So a little bit of context. Um, for big data at Autodesk, we are talking primarily about product usage data. Uh, if, you are if you're not familiar with um, what products Autodesk has, these are AutoCAD, uh, Maya, Inventor, Revit. These are our hero products. We have over 100 products. And so when all, all those 100 products have usage data, have telemetry data, we collect them, it becomes huge. So the good thing about uh, the data that we collect is it's kind of semi-structured. There's some common schema that we um, slap on top of it so that it's easier to process. It's not like, you know, blob here, text there, there video here. It's not. It's text, so it's semi-structured, and it has a common schema. It is also high volume, high velocity data. And just to give an example, our average 
uh, volume of data that we are receiving per hour is 110 gigabytes, uncompressed, and 73 million records per hour. And this is growing. This is on average. At a max peak, we were receiving 157 gigabytes of data per hour and 110 million records per hour. It sounds big, but it can be small. So let's keep that in perspective and do a comparison. So in comparison, the average tweets per hour is only around 21 million, which if you do a rough calculation of a byte math, it translates to around six gigabytes. Six gigabytes is a conservative figure um, because in Twitter, although you have the character limit, you can also post pictures, you can also post like GIF. So even if you bloat that up by 10 times to 60 gig, it is still only half of what we are processing in data, uh, in Autodesk for our data. So this is just a perspective of the uh, volume of data that we are processing. So to handle this kind of high velocity, high volume, semi-structured data, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture of what we've employed in Autodesk. So it's not um, uh, a silver bullet that, that is able to handle this. You have to have data collection. You have to have a storage you know, um, uh, uh, strategy. You would also have to have different tools to access and process these data. So I've kind of um, separated it into big blurbs. And I'm going to talk about the blurbs in a little while. But like I said, basically, we have data collection. So we have two patterns for data collection currently. We're increasing the patterns, but basically what we want are pat ingestion patterns, not use cases that, oh, I'm going to ingest this. This is the, uh, a use case that I have right now. I'm going to create one mechanism or one um, uh, ingestion for it, but it's not <coughs> usable. What we want are patterns. Patterns means that it's plug and play. Today, it's going to be used by this team in the company. Tomorrow, because it's a pattern, it's a plug and play for another team. So right now, we have two of that. Um, we also have data exploration. So once we've collected the data and once we've cleaned it, we want to be able to unlock that data to the internal users. Right? We want them to be able to do their crunching and their ana analytics based on the data that we collect. And ETL, um, for those of you who are not that familiar with data, it's OK. Um, ETL usually stands for extract, transform, load. This is the industry term that we use for batch processing, basically. For the data that we collect, we want to do some aggregations on it to come up with different um, numbers that executives are keen on or are in interested. And ETL is what we call. And finally, ETL and the data exploration serves into the data visualizations. So the dashboards that management see, actually there's an engine behind it. It's not raw data into a dashboard. That is in the realm of science fiction. So uh, there's actually a lot going on before you can populate a dashboard. And I will talk a little bit about that later on. But first, let me talk about the data collection pattern one. So for us, like I said, we have a common schema. And so for each and every product, we do have an SDK. It depends on whatever programming language that they use. But we have a multitude of different language SDKs that they can integrate into their products to collect the data that we have and uh, to collect the data and follow the common schema that we have. There are also some services, meaning internal services, that we use to authenticate users, to authenticate licenses, and all these things. They also instrument using our SDKs, and they send data to our central data lake. So all of them are, this is an abstraction of it. There's a lot more happening in, in the middle. But ultimately, it lands into a AWS service called Kinesis Firehose. And Kinesis Firehose is like, um, it's like a queuing, it's like a message bus, it's like a message queue. It's uh, able to handle high capacity, high volume um, data with a lot of reliability. So recently, in auto, so previously, um, our architecture was not as simplified as this. So when we built the Autodesk data platform, it was five years ago when I started out with the team. And five years ago, Amazon does not have big data offerings. So we used to have to do it on our own. We used to do. We used to use Kafka. We used to use um, a lot of you know, mesos to orchestrate uh, all our clusters. But recently, we move to what we call hug the bear. We want to make, all our, make, use, make the most out of AWS services so that we don't have to uh, develop this on our own. So 
Now it's sending to a Kinesis Firehose. That's a pattern number one. And actually on top you have the users. So these are different kinds of users. So for data, I know it's like a kind of a big dump into you guys, but there is a steep learning curve for data and I'm trying just to um, give you guys a high level understanding so that you can get into why I want to build a big data pipeline. So for big data, there are three, mostly three kinds of users. One is a data analyst. Data analyst, what he or she does is look at the numbers as it is right now and do some analytics on it to get some insights from the data that we have right now. Another, um, data, another role in data is data science. Data science is more around predictive analytics. Based on the data that we collect right now, what do I project the pattern to be? What do I project the trend to be? Therefore, if the trend is going to be this way, we should follow this trend and do these certain actions. It's more prescript prescriptive. And the uh, last but not the least is a data engineer. What does a data engineer do? Data engineer does all of this work on the side, uh, on the back, to set up infrastructure so that the data scientists, the data analysts, and other people in the company can make use of the data, right? So things like this, a data scientist will not know how to integrate them together. Uh, data analyst, forget it. They will not know, right? So these are the users. I went on a tangent, but there are users. Um, and for the SDKs that we have, we have what we call remote control data collection. So if you're familiar with, uh, you may not be familiar, but um, there's a recent law that came out from EU, which is called GDPR. It's all about data, protection, uh, data privacy and data protection. So because of that, we cannot always be collecting data. It cannot be always turned on. Um, there are only certain spurts when we can collect data, and it should be for a purpose. So this is what we call ethical, uh, ethical use of data, right? And in order for us to facilitate that, we have this service called the Experiment Portal, wherein this serves as the remote control to trigger the data collection to toggle it on or off. So once those data analysts say that, hey, there's this question that I want to answer. You know, how many users is using AutoCAD version 2020 release blah, this feature, right? They will do some things on the experiment portal, push that out into all the AutoCADs that are released out there. Those Auto AutoCADs use our SDK, they're instrumented, they will start collecting data. Um, you know, if in this experiments, they have parameters. Oh, I just want to know in the US how many people, blah, blah, blah. So they're, they're going to limit it, the scope of it to US, right? So that's what the experiment portal is. It is backed by Amazon Aurora, which is um, a key value database, basically. And uh, our storage is Amazon S3, object storage. So that's ingestion pattern number one. The second data collection or ingestion pattern is just simple. Uh, any unstructured or semi-structured data, we just need our users to dump it into S3, and we have an automated system backed by Lambda to ingest it into our raw data. So the raw data is a red bucket, um, if, and there's a different bucket for uh, process data, again, because of GDPR, data privacy uh, and, and security. And also, not just that, for processing needs, in order for us to be able to um, process fast and return results fast, we need to be able to segregate the data. <coughs> so the S3 buckets here, here, and you will see another bucket later. This is what we call the data lake. Data lake is a standard industry term as well for big data. It's deep, it's murky. There's a lot of, con uh, there's a lot of confusing data around there. You need to make sense out of data. So next I will talk about ETL. So after the data has been collected, we need to do some processing on it, right? In order for analysts, in order for data scientists to be able to make sense out of the data, first and foremost, we have to clean it. Because even though we are collecting through SDKs, some, there, some instances can happen that causes data to not be clean. For example, some packets are lost, then data is corrupted. Or, uh, you know, a wisecrack engineer did not instrument it properly. It's, you know, expecting an um, integer data type and they sent me, they, they send us a Boolean. So these kinds of things, they have to be weeded out, they have to be cleansed in order for data scientists to be able to use that data that we collect. So underlying in the 
The underlying big data technology that we are using is Spark. And I will talk a little bit about why do we need a big data technology to begin with, right? Um, and the underlying scheduler that we are using is Uzi. Again, I will talk a little bit later about why we need a scheduler. Why can I not just use a cron job, right? So uh, just keep that in mind. I will talk about it in the next few slides. But our big data technology that we're using is Spark. Our scheduler is Uzi. And after what we do basically is um, the data analysts and the other data engineers in the company, they use these technologies to build aggregations. Again, like I said, what are aggregations, right? So when the data is in the data lake, it is deep and murky and it's huge. So in order to answer one particular question, you don't need all of the data. You need an aggregation, a group by of that data, some number, group by this field, give me this number. What are all the licenses that we are using? How many licenses are being used? You don't need, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? You don't need product information. I just want how many licenses are being used. If I want to, if I want to know how many licenses are being used per product, then yes, I need the product information. But I don't need the country information. If I want to know how many licenses are used per product per country, then yes, I need the country information. So these are different kinds of aggregations to answer very specific questions, and those are what we call data cubes. Once an aggregation is built, it becomes part of the data pipeline, and it produces a cube that is usable by data analysts and data scientists. And then we put it to the green S3 bucket over there. It is green because it's open to the public. This one is red because it's raw data. Access is primarily restricted. And then after we do some cleansing, we do some aggregation on the data, we put we open it up for data exploration. So what is data exploration? You know, some analyst in the company, or actually some project product manager in a company, let's say I'm the product manager for AutoCAD. I just released a new feature, feature A. I want to know how well is my feature A doing? How many crashes have been caused by this feature A in the product, right? So all the data is there in the green bucket, but how do I access it, all right? I am able to access it through these technologies. Um, Hive is our meta store, so it's basically metadata about the data. And then we use the Presto Engine. Presto Engine is developed by Facebook, um, but it's a columnar database, basically. And for big data, usually columnar patterns and columnar file formats and databases are a lot faster because they get rid of all the other things that you don't need. If I just want the country, I can get the column of the country. I don't need all the rows of all the data that I have and then filter by country. So it doesn't work that way. Columnar is the way to go. And also, you know, some of them are data scientists. I want to do predictive analytics. For data scientists, mostly they use R or Python. Um, we need to provide uh, interface for them to be able to access our data and use R or Python language <coughs> on top of our data. So that's why we provide that Hive, um, JD, it's, it's a JDBC interface basically. So they can connect their Jupyter notebooks there. They can connect SQL Workbench for SQL-like query languages um, and other things. But basically, these are the uh, supported ones. And finally, after all the crunching research and exploration, we finally, after all that, get to the visualization. So for visualization, our de facto tool, BI tool that we support is Looker. Um, and it, it is backed by Amazon Athena for faster querying. Um, uh, uh, Looker is what we support, but we can also have Tableau. We can, oh, finally a female, welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Looker, as I was saying, Looker is a de facto BI tool that we support, but because of the JDBC interface, we are able to support Tableau. We're able to support ClickView as well. Yeah. So this is overall the big data infrastructure architecture that we have to handle the product usage data. Right. So remember I said, why do we need a big data technology to process big data? Is it not as simple just as you know, a database or querying, right? And why do we need a scheduler? Why not just cron, right? So for the big data technology, usually it operates on the concept of MapReduce, right? And why do we need MapReduce? 
So what is MapReduce? MapReduce is, operates on the notion of instead of bringing data to the processing, which can be costly, we bring, we bring processing to the data. Now I give you a very basic example. For example, you're, using, you're doing a word count, right? And you want to write an application for word count. Imagine that the file, your input, is 10 gigabytes. If you write an application using shell script, let's say, you know, grep, and then wc minus, minus l, right? You can get a word count. That actually downloads the 10 gigabyte of data into your local or wherever, which, whichever environment you are um, running your application on. And that download alone takes a long time. It's 10 gigabytes. We're talking about 110 gigabytes here. So instead of bringing the data to the processing, what we do is let the data stay there. We bring the processing code to the data, because usually the code is small anyway. The source code for it is MBs at best. Right. So this is what MapReduce is all about. So for MapReduce, this is, this is what it usually does. So for example, a word count. Right? There's um, XBB, CBA, XAC. I, actually, this character count. I want to count how many characters there are. So what they do is actually they split it. Oh, by the way, sorry, I am forgot to mention. One other thing that is great with MapReduce is they can parallelize it. Um, of course, you can also write a script that you know um, has threading and all these things, but it comes it becomes very difficult to maintain, very difficult to track. So for MapReduce, they do that innately. They parallelize it innately. So you have three lines here. For example, they will have three nodes that what we call partitions, right? And they will allocate like the first line on that node, the second line on the second node, and the third line on the third node. And you will employ the same script, the same logic for counting in all the three nodes. So what it does it, uh, is on the first node, it will split. I have one instance of x, one instance of b, and another instance of b. So x1, b1, b1. Same thing is, same logic applies in the second node. I have one c, I have one b, I have one a, and so on. And the third node, I have x. And what happens is that there's a shuffle that happens in between to make sure that the nodes only what we call the partitions only have uh, one character allocated to them. In this instance, it's one character, but in a different example I'll give later, um, you can understand a little bit better what I mean. So for A, I, um, for the partition of A, I have two instances of A based from this once they shuffle. Same thing with B, I have three instances of B, two instances of C, and two instances of X. And after they combine and sort and what in, in the step that we call reduce, which is the last one, the reduce will actually give us the counts. So altogether, I have two A's, I have three B's, I have two C's and two X's. This is what happens in MapReduce. Now it's a very basic example. How do we use it, right? For example, again, we are collecting product usage data. Pro, uh, data comes from AutoCAD, Maya, Revit, Inventor. If I want to segregate their data, <coughs> How do I do it? It's the same pattern, right? We will just, you know, partition it by product and count the number of what, whatever filter that I want to give it, count the number of licenses per that product. It will operate in the same manner like this. Okay, so that's about MapReduce, right? Now, why Spark? Oh, okay, so um, MapReduce, this one has been, um, around for a long time. Um, it started out with the technology that we call Hadoop. Uh, some of you may have heard it, it's that elephant. So Hadoop actually, when it came out, it was uh, really great. It was a huge jump in the processing time of uh, uh, processing big data. It, it was a breath of fresh air. But actually MapReduce has a lot of um, <coughs> uh, improvements that can be done on it. Although it's fast, you know, they're always iterate and they'll always come up with something better. So why Spark? Right. In traditional MapReduce, data sharing is very slow. Because why? Because in order for them um, to, uh, to be able to process, read, and write the data, they have what they call Hadoop file system. And that is how they are able to split into different nodes. They have to have their own file system. But in order for them to share that data for intermediate results, let's say you have a ha MapReduce 1, followed by a second MapReduce in order to get to the, to the final result. The intermediate results, they have to do I.O. They have to write, persist it to disk. 
And that is why data sharing is very slow in traditional MapReduce. So it goes something like this. For example, data is on the disk. They will load it to their Hadoop file system. They will do the maps first. And then they need to write whatever they map on disk. So if you look at this example, they need to write this to disk first before it can be reduced. And that causes I.O. So um, a lot of time, it spends around 90% of the time on serialization, replication, and I.O. just because of this. So what Spark does is that it came out with this notion of what they call, it's a shared, um, it's shared memory. So what Spark does is that it processes data in memory, and that's what makes it 10 to 100 times faster. And they came out with this notion of what they call resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs for short. So in between, instead of writing to disk, they have a Spark context. And as long as you are in that Spark context, you can share the memory. And that's what makes it fast. So in Spark, it removes expensive operation by introducing shareable memory, what I said, resilient distributed data sets. And this is how it then looks like. So we have an iteration of map first. And the, the memory is distributed, it's shared. And then the second map, and then the third map, and then finally, if it, oh, and another thing about Spark is that in Hadoop, every map requires a reduce. Even though sometimes, logically, you don't require a reduce, it maps, reduce, maps, reduce, and writes to file. In Spark, you don't need to reduce. You can map and map and map, and then finally reduce in the end. This is also an optimization. So Spark has a lot more optimizations on why it's a lot faster than Hadoop. Um, and right now, we are at Spark 2.4, or 3.0 is like in beta, but 2.4. Um, there are a lot more, but I'm just talking about the, the biggest thing over Hadoop that they have, or, on why it's 10 to 100 times faster. So this is why we need the big data technology. Because of the amount of volume, uh, uh, the volume of data that we have, it's very expensive and sometimes impossible to bring the data to the processing. We have to bring the processing to the data. And that's why we need the big data technology. So next, why do we need a scheduler? Why not just cron, right? So we are talking about, again, I need to remind you guys, it's big data. And for big data, sometimes, you, you cannot, pro no, actually, let me take that back. Most of the times, you cannot process in sequence. You have to parallelize it. So let's say uh, start action, you can fork like into three actions, and then those three actions further fork into three actions. Using cron, yeah, possible, but is it the best way to do it, right? So we have what we call a directed acyclical graph. So it's just fancy word, honestly. It's a conceptual representation. So we break down the words. A graph, it's a graphical representation. Directed means a single directional, one way. And acyclical means there are no loops. So directed acyclical graph, right? It's single directional flow with no loops that's represented in a graph. And then it's most often used in data processing for a series of computations um, run on data to prepare for one or more ultimate destinations. Uh, and there can be more than one paths in the flow. So an example of a directed a cyclical graph looks like this. Um, I know it's very small, but this is taken from our production system. So here you can see it's a fork. In this particular instance, it shows this fork, and it's still running. Yellow is running. This means it's not, it hasn't succeeded or failed yet. Right. So for the DAG that we are using, we are using Uzi as a scheduler. OK, so enough about theory. Um, let me, let's put it all together and let's build a big data production pipeline, right? So no, I don't have live demos. I will just share with you some uh, scripts and some uh, code on how you do it because it, in, in 30 or 45 minutes, honestly, it's, we're not going to be able to cover all that if I do a live demo. So basically, first you create a MapReduce function. So I know, oh, it's a, it'll, it's a little bit small, but this is our production code as well. So <laughs> if you can see, this one is cleaning the raw data. So we've specified three kinds of cleansing that we want to do here. One is the valid, valid logs. Second one is invalid logs. And third one is corrupted. Very simple, corrupted. It's not a JSON cannot parse it. Our file format is JSON. Invalid means there's a, file, uh, there's a uh, data type that's, that it's expecting 
and the incoming data did not conform to that data time. For example, I'm expecting a string. They gave me a Boolean. It doesn't conform. So, um, so we have to do. So this is based off of this. The programming language used here in, is Scala because um, Spark is natively built on Scala. Spark does support uh, Java as well, Python as well. But for us, we chose to write in Scala nearest to the um, underlying technology that is processing the data for you know to don't to not lose the memory overhead for JVMs basically. So in the I will I'm creating a log path array, and in that array I have spec specified three right so valid, invalid, and corrupted, and then I'm gonna do dot par par does, that means parallelize. So I want to parallelize um, this execution in a dot map. Again, dot map, like what I showed you, it just segregates it into um, the category. So what this does is that given the inputs, I'm going to segregate it into valid, invalid, corrupted. That's what it does in parallel. And then, so validate is an internal function doing something else. Let's forget about that. And then finally, if we do some we do some counts obviously invalidate so invalidate if we do some counts if it passes then we just say that the counts of the valid corrupt and invalid are correct and it's successful and then we go ahead and save this rdd what save rdd does is just it writes to s3 nothing else and then if not it just says error basically oh and by the way uh, again here rdds.par parallel mapping save to RDD, so parallel saving to S3. That, that is what makes it very fast. So this is very simplistic um, and very simple um, example of a MapReduce function in Spark. Then after you've compiled this, this runs, you know, you've verified it, you've debugged it, it works fine. What you need to do now is schedule a workflow. Again, we're building a production data pipeline. Um, and in the end, I will tell you why do we need to build it. Um, okay, so we scheduled a, a workflow. This workflow is the action. This is the action. Okay, you, I tell it that you do the raw clean for me. This is the configuration, and that's that. And I schedule it every day. Right. So, Uzi syntax is don't ask me. It's XML. Yes, it's outdated, but this is what it is. Then, once it ran, of course you have to verify your data. So I've redacted some data over there because I, I don't want to violate anything. Um, so can you see, is it very small, the text here? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. It looked fine in my big screen. <laughs> but basically, it's a select from that table that I was creating. Um, and I just um, did the partition pruning on the date. That's it, simple. And I limit by 20. So this is the result it gave me. That means my job ran successfully. This data is now there in, the, in S3. And then after everything, I create a visualization on top of it. This shows me like how, min how much raw data I got. Um, of those data, how much are invalid, how much are corrupted. And we have a second version, a second part of the processing which has abnormal and um, delayed and all these things. But basically, this is a dashboard that I'm, I've created. Now, to answer the question, why do I need to build a big data pipeline? It's because this have to be updated every day. So when executives are asking questions, how, mu how many licenses are being used? They're, the questions are not usually just a one-time basis. They're usually asking on a daily level, how, how many licenses do we have today? How many subscribers do we have today? How many subscribers do we have tomorrow? Yesterday, how many, how, how, what's the trend? How do we compare? So in order to establish that trend, and in order to um, populate a dashboard that updates on a daily level, you need to build a production data pipeline that runs hourly, daily, monthly, depending on the need. Just a one-time run, scheduling it on a cron, it doesn't work. And it's a little bit nuanced, but um, in order to create a production data pipeline, it requires a little bit uh, adjustment into the mindset and into the thinking. It's not your regular programming. Um, regular programming, that sounds like TV. It's not like your regular application development. It requires a little bit thinking of parameterizations for dates, parameterizations for certain fields. It it's, not, you know, it's not rocket science, but it does require a different kind of thinking. Right? So I've put um, 
I reserved some room for the Q&A, but I just want to let you know that I've put some of the resources here as well. You can take a look at Spark if you're interested. You can take a look at uh, Uzi if you're interested as well. And these are, th the first three are basically, okay, the first two are basically around what is big data. And the third one is an introduction to Spark. Why is Spark better than Hadoop? So that's the end of my presentation. I reserve some room for Q&A. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning that uh, like you're moving everything from in-house to AWS. How worried are you about like vendor locking? Great question. That's the first question that I ask our architect. So um, honestly, there are, there are advantages to vendor lock-in. Um, one being in an enterprise, right? We don't want an enterprise where you know, what we're building in this VPC cannot talk to another VPC purely because they're different vendors, right? <coughs> the second one is, honestly, if you think, if you take a calculated guess, AWS is not gonna go away anytime soon, at least not in my lifetime. <laughs> so there's very little worry around that. And actually Autodesk, what we've done is we've uh, taken one step further to partner with AWS. So um, it, uh, uh, a good point that I wanted to bring up. So I mentioned previously, right, we built this um, in-house. Uh, so when we were partnering with AWS and they were coming out with these new services, their services could not handle our load and our use cases. So that partnership was really helpful for them, for them to be able to ramp up their services. At the same time, it's helpful for us because then it becomes managed. We don't want to manage it. We don't want to, you know, our 10 people, 10 engineer team cannot uh, battle with their like 100, 100 engineer team, right? So it's a win-win in that case. So we've partnered with AWS as well. So kind of that, that sense of fear and that sense of um, apprehension, it's not there at all. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, so um, the, okay, I know you said apart from manage, but I wanna kind of take a step back there because when we say manage, it's not just someone is managing it up and down. It's also around SLAs, right? For the data that we are collecting previously, just to give you an example, when we were um, using Kafka, we were losing around 30% of our data. And it is because the amount of data coming in is a lot, bigger and a lot faster than what the Kafka can handle. So when we switch to AWS, it's, it's not just about reliability and someone maintaining it for us. It's also around their SLAs and their capability to auto scale up, auto scale down based on our needs. And the amount that we pay for that managed service is, uh, is pennies in comparison to you know, having one or two people dedicated to maintaining this Kafka, Kafka stream to auto scale it, auto scale it down. And at the same time, if we've already lost data, you know, yes, we can retroactively fix it, but there's no going back to collect that data again. So in terms of why, what's the benefit? Um, it, it's not so much technical and not so much managed as the promise that AWS has given to us that there's no data loss. And true enough, after we've switched to AWS, we've not, we have 99.9% .9 of our data. There's point, Zero zero one loss, but that is acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. Anyone? Any other questions? What? What else? Mm, how come like there's so much data from the Autodesk products? Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a good question. Uh, it depends on what the product is. So because Autodesk has like 120 plus products, most of them are around manufacturing and construction. And most, well, our biggest one is for design. For AutoCAD is both design and manufacturing. So there are instances I know, for example, for AutoCAD, there is what we call telemetry data. Every mouse movement is tracked. So that is why there's a huge amount of data being collected. Now that's for AutoCAD. There's an other products, let's say, for example, for structural analysis. Um, every uh, action that AutoCAD takes also introduces or also calls them a thousand times. So imagine that one 
slight mouse movement generates a thousand calls we get that data and for AutoCAD as well any every mouse movement generates that thousand so that's why the data is huge yeah yeah it's mostly around how commands are used and mostly around you know uh, different geographical locations basically they've put in their code uh, when you hit this get the data when you hit this get the data yeah. Yeah. thanks for asking do we have time what else I think we have time maybe for one more question if you have any All right, I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone.